So thank you very much. That was very engaging and very powerful. This focus, we, we started the day really fundamentally making the case and exploring the question of how do all of our initiatives work to make the world a better place. And so the way in which collaborations and partnerships are formed, identifying challenges, identifying need, looking specifically at how nonprofits are uh, curated and really facilitated to respond to those needs, and how healthcare itself, in many of its iterations, nonprofit sector addressing human needs and um, really seeking to engage those constructively. One key thread that we could see throughout the entire day is this question of decision making and really fundamentally the role of leaders in identifying what values are, identifying what priorities are, and making decisions in support of the good that we seek to accomplish. So we seek to end today by a reflection in a presentation on decision making, ethical decision making, and the role and impact of artificial intelligence related to that. So we're doing a little bit of logistics here, as you can see. Um, so that we won't have chairs in the way of the screen that will be lowered momentarily. And uh, we are very honored to welcome as our final presentation, Brian Green, the Director of Technology Ethics from the Marcula Center for Applied Ethics, Santa Clara University. Brian, it's great to have you with us. I just want to say thank you very much to uh, Jeff in particular and also to everyone else who's been involved in putting together this uh, conference symposium today. It's been a really great uh, time seeing what everyone is talking about and uh, it's a good chance for me to uh, kind of say a few words. Let's see as soon as we get that up on the screen there. What's that? Oh, do I have a clicker? Is this a clicker? Did it work? Yeah. Make sound. <laughs> right. Talk about technology. All right. So this is basically going to be a talk about some of the things that are happening with if we turn over decision-making capacity, externalize it from human beings, what happens next? Uh, these folks are just laying around waiting for food to fall in their mouths. This is an old picture from like 500 years ago. Uh, you know, it's an vision of paradise, right? You just lay around all day long and food falls in your mouth. Is that what the future is going to be like? Oh, let's see. Not that button. Down button. All right. There we go. All right. Um, so as Stephen Adler noted this morning, um, there are some risks of unintended consequences and un unwise trade-offs that come with AI. Um, moral de-skilling is one of those trade-offs or unintended consequences that I think uh, we have to think about. But before we get into that, I just want to talk a little bit about this. Uh, whenever I talk about tech ethics in general, it's, it's good to get a big picture. What's going on in the large, large scheme of things? And, and just recognize that AI is one particular kind of technology that um, comes from a history of technology and technological development that humans have been doing for a long, long time. So if you go back in human history, you can think we were basically involuntarily constrained by our weakness in the past, right? We couldn't build skyscrapers, we couldn't build giant ships or airplanes or nuclear bombs or anything like that. We were involuntarily constrained in the, jo in the choices we could make. Now, we don't have those involuntary constraints on us anymore. That means we can do a lot of things that we couldn't do in the past and now we have to decide what's actually good or not when we have all these powers. So technology gives us power and efficiency. We need to learn to be efficient at good and inefficient at evil. Otherwise, guess what? We're going to live in a bad place, right? So uh, one of the quotes that I have later on in this presentation is uh, from Peter Morin, who's one of the founders of the Catholic Worker Movement. He said, we need to make a world where it's easier for people to be good. It's also very important to make a world where it is very difficult to be evil, where it's harder to be bad. So think about that balance between those two things. And number three up there, intelligence, including artificial intelligence, because you should just think of maybe AI as being kind of a subset of what's possible due to intelligence, 
combined with power, so we have this power from technology, we've got intelligence now, and these are gonna be kind of interacting with each other. Uh, these give us a bunch of choices, and ethics, this is where ethics comes into it, ethics tells us which among those choices are good. So we have to figure out, we've got these options in front of us, which of them are we gonna actually take? All right, so what is moral de-skilling? Moral de-skilling is basically a loss of skill and making decisions uh, due to lack of experience and practice. So here's the example, which um, basically I've been telling people for a while. My brother-in-law is a pilot, and he said everything about piloting an aircraft can be automated and turned over to the autopilot. From takeoff, everything from backing up from the gate where the little truck releases you, all the way to landing and pulling into the gate. That could be completely automated. They don't do that. They only use autopilot for the middle boring part of the flight because they don't want to lose skill. They want to maintain their takeoff and landing and taxiing skills because that's important. Because if you mess that up, if you turn it over to something else and then you don't know how to do it anymore and then you lose the thing that was doing, that was giving that capacity, then you are not good at it anymore. All of a sudden an emergency will happen, you'll get thrown into a situation that you can't handle. Um, and this is a fairly well-known phenomenon in various things. This has one, been one of the things holding up self-driving cars, actually, because um, there's something called the trade-off problem where you're driving down the road and then all of a sudden it reverts to your control and guess what? You're not prepared to, it takes something like, you know, 15 seconds to get control and usually it happens with like a second before the accident's going to happen. Um, so if you, but if you had been paying attention all that time, if you had been exercising your skill, then you wouldn't have had that same trade-off or that same uh, problem that happens. All right, so basically I'm gonna argue that moral de-skilling is a particular uh, instantiation of a very large and long-term movement in human history. Basically, um, over time, everything has been getting more organized, more complex, more specialized. Uh, why is that? Because it produces efficiency. The efficiency then kind of forms a self-reinforcing cycle where you're constantly, you're, you're freeing up more time and then you can specialize more and then you free up more time and then you specialize more, which is why back in the past, something like 99% of all people were involved in subsistence farming. And nowadays, how many people do we have being farmers in the US? Something around 2% was the number that I've heard recently. So it's a very, very small number. 98% of people are now involved in other tasks because farming has become so incredibly efficient. All right, so one way to think about AI is that AI is actually kind of like just an organization. We've had organizations like corporations, bureaucracies, governments, societies, uh, who have been operating as kind of like slow AIs for a very long time. People have been interacting with each other. You know, they have a discussion, should we do this? Uh, everybody's conversing, you have the, the conversation. Hopefully it's a good conversation, you don't have a room full of people making bad choices because that ends up with bad decisions being made, right? But ultimately, if you're gonna run an entire civilization, you need a lot of people to do it, and so humans have figured out ways to do that by organizing and forming these complex and specialized uh, groups of people operating with certain rules, kind of like programs. All right, so organizations, of course, have benefits. Um, because you can do much, much bigger things with large organizations of people. They also have known failure modes. For example, groupthink, poor internal communication, slowness, uh, and both rigidity and fragility. So you can get really stuck in one manner, and then that can, you can run into fragility in other ways. And uh, you know, those kind of interact with each other in, in, a, in a certain way also. <clears throat> So fragility and robustness. This is uh, something that uh, you know, sociologists and economists and various other people have talked about in different uh, contexts. But if you put them together, basically we're moving towards a more efficient, centralized, systematized, specialized, interdependent, organized, complex type of more fragile situation. And you say to yourself, what do you mean it's more fragile? We can do a whole bunch more stuff than we could in the past. It totally depends how you set up the system, right? Nobody predicted, well, some people predicted the 2008 financial crisis. Uh, but if more people had predicted it, then it wouldn't have actually happened, right? So obviously there is a fragility there that nobody knew about because of the large system. On the other hand, if you want to avoid that type of fragile system, you can have a very inefficient, decentralized, non-systematized, non-specialized, independent, non-organized, non-complex, and robust system um, where we all live with a lot less risk 
but guess what? You end up wasting a lot of talent, you're uncoordinated, uh, uncooperative, and if you look at things like the do-it-yourself movement, I mean, not, I'm not trying to criticize the do-it-yourself movement because that's great. Um, I'm not even necessarily criticizing preppers there. But everybody, if everybody had to do that, think of how much time would get sucked out of everything else that people are doing, right? It would all of a sudden kind of shift the way your culture and civilization is structured. So right now, we're, as we're moving away from that kind of self-independence uh, and into a kind of more group type uh, solidarity or a centralized system, you're just trading off one thing for another by the way people are spending their time and resources. All right, you ask yourself, okay, what's all this have to do with AI? I'll get to that in a moment. So basically, how many of us here could manage a subsistence farm, right? Anybody here feel they could do that? Not a single hand. Wait, I got one hand, two hands, okay. So we all turn to them if anything goes wrong. Uh, how many of us could here hunt or fish well enough to keep ourselves alive? or could raise and manage animals. So there are various things that, ways that people have kept themselves alive in the past, right? Uh, how many of us could manually operate a telephone switchboard? I know that there's still people alive who can do this, and uh, the one woman I know, who I know can do this actually lives here in LA, so that's good. Uh, she's 97 or something, she's very old, uh, but she's very healthy, she's still on Facebook, she's my Facebook friend, so it's great. Um, but what about a loom? I mean, this, you might not be able to see the picture there, but it's a hand loom for weaving cloth. Um, any other piece of archaic technology. We leave these things behind as we move on, right? But if we become dependent on electricity and AI and things like that, all of a sudden we could get into situations where we don't know how to do things that are pretty basic. All right, so we're de-skilled, right? We're de-skilled at some very basic stuff. Uh, but congratulations also, because we live in a complex society where this doesn't hurt us that much. It's actually a good thing because we get to use our other skills to make a living. Now, if we're talking about advances of technology in the future, uh, there may be occupations in the future that make what we do right now look really archaic. People will say, wow, uh, people used to go to conferences. Why would you have to be there in person? Why can't we do this through VR? Or why did people do you know, any other sorts of things uh, that we think to be pretty common nowadays? All right. So here's another kind of connection that I'm trying to make. In the past, how did you specialize to get something done? You directed a person towards that task. Why is that? Because people were the best kind of technology, quote unquote, to use. You take a person and you direct them towards that task. Um, we're the best, you know, the smartest thing around basically and generally had the best muscles. I don't know if it's visible up there, but it's an ox plowing a field there with two people around it. Uh, so sometimes we used animals also in case, you know, humans aren't strong enough. So first we specialized human knowledge. Uh, next we specialized, oh, first we specialized that into humans. Then we specialized it into machines. Now we're taking intelligence itself and putting it into machines. Now, if there's something important about intelligence itself for human identity and the way humans operate, this is kind of a significant action here, where all of a sudden we're taking perhaps our most defining characteristic and externalizing it from ourselves, putting it into other objects. So what are we gonna do? All right, so AI kind of puts efficiency on steroids is kind of the way I describe it. Um, it's an amplifier, in other words, you get to do much bigger things. You can have a data set with 15 million records in it and actually get information out of it. If a human did that, it would be possible perhaps to get some types of information out of that if you're just a human without, you know, type of machine learning resources and stuff like that. You know, there, there are ways to sift through that. People have been doing it for a long time. However, once you start getting machine learning working on that and other types of AI techniques, all of a sudden you've got a much bigger type of project that you can do. You can do it much more fat, much more quickly and much more effectively. So financial services are way invested into machine learning. Uh, relationships, you know, something very basic in human life, right? Relationships can, has been uh, turned over to AI whenever using Facebook or other types of apps. Um, navigation, getting from place to place. I had a friend once, I asked him, how did you get to Berkeley from Stanford? And he said, I don't know. And I'm like, do you know what bridge you went across? Because that would kind of tell me how you got here, because you could take one bridge or the other. And he said, no, I don't know. He was just following his navigation. So, you know, if you, if you took away his navigation, he might not be able to get around. Um, news and information. 
works very well as long as you're getting real information, right? As soon as somebody starts interfering with that and putting fake information into your, to your system, all of a sudden you've uh, got a big problem. Of course, food. AI, AI is moving into food and agriculture, which is kind of interesting, not just in terms of setting prices and trying to s move things around, but also in terms of actually having self-driving tractors um, because you can actually set up a, a field as being a very controlled environment. And uh, there's at least one example of a tractor. It goes across the field and it, can, it uses visual recognition technology. It recognizes what the farming plant looks like, that you want to keep that. And the plant that you don't want is a weed, so it sees the weed and it sprays it with a tiny microdose of herbicide right on its leaves, very precise, and then it just drives through the field and does that. So you reduce the amount of herbicide used, uh, it's environmentally uh, friendlier, uh, costs less, all these other good things about it. All right, so what about AI replacing moral decision-making capacities? Um, is this going to happen? Uh, well, we already know that we use organizations to control human behavior. We have laws, we have uh, government culture, uh, specialized citizens make and enforce law uh, so as to promote or suppress certain behaviors. All this helps out because it kind of keeps us from having to think about ethics as if we were all living in anarchy, right? If we all of a sudden were living in anarchy, you'd have a lot more moral decisions to make. Uh, maybe you need to be scrambling over resources differently or forming organizations with other people around you banding together. I don't know, it'd be really complicated. But one of the nice things about not living in anarchy is that it frees us up from having to worry about all these things that people in more anarchic situations have to worry about. So you can think of AI as being a way of extending governmental power, if you want to think about it that way. Uh, and various totalitarian regimes see that and they're like, wow, that's a great idea. We're going to do that. We're already doing it. Or some places are. All right. So what are some examples of that? Uh, and also, what are some examples of where humans are in the loop or not? So humans in the loop. Uh, so for example, when you go onto Amazon, it recommends things to you. It doesn't just come up with a list and say, I know that this person wants this and just sends it to you, right? It charges you and sends you something. No, that doesn't happen with Amazon. It asks you first before you want something. That'll be the next step though, right? It'll just start automatically billing you and sending you stuff. Um, military drones, humans are usually in the loop. Basically, the and, and, and I'm speaking not just for the United States, but for other countries here. There are some countries uh, who have developed for example, automated machine guns that you sit on the border and it is under human control unless you say we're at war, so you're on automatic control now and it just shoots anything that moves, right? So humans are in the loop for now. Um, the United States military has a rule which is that if it is lethal, then it has to be human controlled. If it's not lethal, then it can be automated. So, but, but the, you know, making that division is basically, a, 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 you know, it's a, uh, it's a decision that's easily reversible, right? All you have to do is take one of your already automated drones and stick weapons on it. Uh, Self-driving cars, humans are in the loop for now. Stock trading, humans have been out of the loop for a while on that. Um, and in some cases we should be in the loop, but then we get na lazy about it, right? So we were talking about the compass algorithm earlier. Basically that was involved in recidivism calculations. Uh, and there are various other examples of this, calculating bail, sentencing, parole, welfare, fraud detection, uh, health care, and things like that. So then the question is, wait, is technology going to make us all lazy and negligent? Um, now, through division of labor, this already has happened, like I was arguing. This is just kind of a continuation of, our, of what's already happening with division of labor, I would argue. I don't know how to set bail or parole. I'm glad there's somebody else who does do that. However, if you automate that, there are going to be fewer people doing it. And if there are fewer people doing it and who are good at it, and you've turned it over to an automated system that has mistakes in it, then there are going to be fewer people to catch the mistakes. So we're lucky that there are people right now who are watching these things. But if we turn it over completely, uh, we're in a situation where we've de-skilled ourselves. Now, at the Partnership on AI meeting, in Berlin last year, which was kind of their kickoff meeting. It was right when the Partnership on AI started. Um, one of the speakers went up there and he said, we're going to reproduce all our human faults in AI form unless we endeavor not to do so right now. And we've already seen this happening, right, in terms of bias and you end up with computers that are sexist and racist and various other things that, are, that they're doing wrong. So that's a certainly true statement. But it's not just a matter of reproducing our faults in the machine, right? Uh, rather, 
those machines can amplify those faults and make them bigger and sy more systemic. And at the same time, we're going to be weakening ourselves at being able to do those same things. All right, so I just want to use the example of politics for a moment. Um, I would argue that the United States is becoming, has become politically de-skilled. And one of our speakers was just talking about that. He was saying, why was it that the participation rate in the mayoral election in Los Angeles was 76% back in, I can't remember what year. Um, OK, so 1969. And nowadays, the participation rate is down at 20%. Is that what he said? That's a huge drop in, in the number of people participating. If you live in a participatory form of government, you better be able to participate, right? You've got to be able to handle the skill that's needed for, for actually making the government operate. Um, are we skilled enough? Uh, or have we abdicated our skills to other people, right? Are there, we, we just kind of said, hey, I think the politicians can handle it. I don't need to worry about this anymore, right? I don't worry about all sorts of things because I assume somebody else is handling it. If we do that in a participatory form of government, and then something starts going wrong, then you end up with, what, 80% of the population who are not voting and the country's not operating very well, or maybe the city if you're just at a local level. All right, so is it a poor educational system? That's probably part of it. Uh, massive distraction. There are so many interesting things that are grabbing our attention all the time. Uh, we're having trouble with political life. We've got fake news, science denial. If our population was very well educated in the first place, then fake news and science denial wouldn't really have a chance to get into people's heads, right? There wouldn't be anything to grab onto. But because we're not very well educated, uh, these things actually tend to latch onto a certain segment of the population. So democracy requires a lack of political specialization. In other words, we all need to maintain that skill as a collective, as the entire country, right? All the citizens, all the voters in the country need to have that as a skill. Uh, everyone who can vote is responsible, not just an elite few. And since specialization is such a powerful trend, this has to be actively fought in some sense. So even though you know, everything in society is trying to drive us towards specialization, if we live in a democracy, we have to resist that and figure out what methods we can utilize in order to constantly input energy in order to get people uh, still at a level where they can make good political decisions. All right, so moral de-skilling, I would say, is the same kind of thing. And it, you know, if practice makes perfect, then lack of practice makes imperfect, right? Uh, if we don't put in the energy to become good people, we're not going to be good people. Uh, if we don't fight the many influences trying to reduce our moral capacity, then we're going to have our moral capacity reduced. All right, so this is something my students pointed out to me a couple years ago. Uh, we were talking about, I believe we were talking about the Chinese social credit scoring system, um, but we, we also had a couple other instances in class where people have been talking about how their smartphones were always bothering them, or you know, your smartphone is telling you to do something, or some other piece of technology is nudging you in a certain direction. And what they figured out is technology is becoming our mom. So that was their word, not mine. Um, and, and this is, uh, in particular, it was a student um, who was saying, you know what, my, I feel like my cell phone is my mom. Uh, scheduling me, reminding me to do things, setting me up on dates, gives me directions, tells me what restaurants to eat at, uh, what jobs and schools are best, uh, gives me the news, coordinates our activities, mediates our activities and communications, evaluates us, and of course reports to others. And this was kind of an interesting thing. All the other students were like, yeah, I guess you're right. <laughs> uh, you know, it kind of depends on what family you're from, perhaps. Um, and and, and uh, some other students said, no, that's my dad, not my mom. So, you know, it can go both ways. Um, and yet, we can kind of see this idea. It's, you know, it wants to be helpful. Your parent wants to be helpful. Um, but there's a line between helping and controlling, right? So where, where is that line going to be? Um, so we already got poor education, distraction, and parentalization. Um, as if those aren't bad enough, there's also further infantilization by stunting our interpersonal interaction. In other words, if you're constantly staring at a screen, you're not actually going out there and interacting with other people. You might be interacting with people through the screen, but that's a very different interaction than actually talking to people in person. So practical wisdom, you can go all the way back to Aristotle and a whole, you know, other philosophers in history have said practical wisdom requires experience and practice. Aristotle specifically said there's no such thing as a child moral genius. You'll find 
child mathematical prodigies and child musical prodigies, you'll not find a child moral prodigy. You'll find kids that are nice, and you'll find kids that are very generous and things like that. But because they don't have the experience, they can't really figure out how to apply those things in complicated situations. So if technology is our parent here, then it's actually kind of stunting our growth in order to keep us at home. That's the kind of thing that I want you to be thinking, OK, okay if that's the analogy we're using, then this is the, the kind of thing you've got to break out of this situation. It's kind of an unhealthy dependency, right? So can we fight back? And of course, the answer is yes. Uh, education is going to be one of the main ones. You want to teach and reward not just knowledge and understanding, but practical wisdom and moral leadership. Now, those are things that are going to be, that are, they're a little bit more difficult to teach, right? Um, but I would argue that this is something that engineering schools have actually figured out to do in terms of technology. They have a senior design project where they have to lead and develop something and produce a product at the end. It might not be a product that ultimately sells or something like that, but we know that there are ways in order to get people working together in teams, solving problems, and displaying leadership. Uh, I think we just had you know, four people up here in the panel who had each been doing that themselves. They had become leaders in their own way. We also need to emphasize human maturation and moral development. In other words, if the technology is trying to be our parent and we are trying to be infantilized by it, then we need to resist. We need to practice good habits. We need to pay attention. In other words, we need to acquire new information around us. And we need to do that in such a way that we're making sure we're picking up real information and not fake information. And we need to learn how to interact with other humans. How do we actually all relate to each other? And then kind of ethics facilitation. So this goes back to Peter Morin, like I was saying before. Peter Morin, one of the founders of the Catholic Worker Movement. Create a society in which it's easier to be good. How do we set up that kind of society? Um, there was a German philosopher, and I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but he said, first comes food, then morality. In other words, if you don't have any food, you're going to work really hard just to get your food, even if that means doing some, you know, whatever, whatever sketchy things you need to do in order to get it. So you, you need to kind of fulfill people's basic human needs first if you want to have a moral society. If you're not fulfilling that, um, that basic level, then you can't get to kind of the more sophisticated level on top of it. Now, that's just the basic level, right? We know that there are lots of people with lots of money and resources who still do lots of bad things, so it's only a start. All right, and then should we? We can, but should we? And of course, yes, I would say practical wisdom will always be a defining trait of a good human being. Uh, morality and ethics never go out of style. Being a good person is always going to be a worthy goal. Insofar as technology is trying to stunt it, stunt our moral growth, then it needs to be resisted. And technology has to serve humanity and not vice versa, right? <coughs> All the trends in technology towards parentalizing and infantilizing us are not actually trends in tech, right? This is the other thing to remember. This is something that humans are doing. We're creating these technologies, and we are consuming these technologies. And but, so based on that, if we're consuming them and we are ended up being, you know what, de-skilled or infantilized or however we want to think of it, then that's something we have to resist as an active choice on ourselves. We can set up a system where that's easier, right? Make the technology less addictive. Turn your phone to grayscale. Um, I, I saw this recommended, I think it was back in Lent, somebody was saying it, so back in February of this year, saying, hey, try setting your phone to grayscale. See how, see how it's less in interesting to you. Um, I did it, and then I quickly discovered that I can't really use Waze in grayscale. I need to be able to see the colors on there. So I switched it back. But one of my other friends, who, who doesn't have to drive around as much as I do, did that, and he left it that way. And it still is in grayscale, because that way he doesn't feel like he has to, he's not so attracted to the colors. So it's actually really interesting. Uh, kind of hack that you can do in your own head. All right, back in 1943, C.S. Lewis in The Abolition of Man said, what we call man's power over nature turns out to be a power exercised by some men over other men with nature as the instrument. So this is an interesting thing about technology, right? We say, oh, technology is this, or technology is that, and wow, humans are more powerful than nature. That was kind of what C.S. Lewis's point here was, is that humans, uh, he, he had a friend who was dying of cancer or something like that, and his, cancer, his, his friend said, um, wow, we've really got nature licked. We've got, you know, nature's, you know, it's, we got it under control. Meanwhile, he's dying of cancer, right? Um, and so C.S. Lewis pondered this for a while, and he said, actually, what's going on here 
is that some humans are taking those ideas or, or those things that we learn from nature, turning them into technology, and then inflicting them back on each other. And of course, in the middle of World War II, when this was happening, it was particularly obvious. You mine a bunch of nitrates out of the ground, turn them into bombs, and drop them on each other. And that was what a large amount of uh, people's time and attention was pointed towards at that point. All right. So, but then there's the question of can we fight against this? So some philosophers of technology have said that this is inevitable. Um, and of course, it, we can't predict the future, so we don't really know. But we can see that this is a very long-term trend. Um, things are very complex. We're going to keep specializing and organizing and integrating human civilization into a unified whole. And technology is going to be one of the tools that makes that possible. Um, it might be inexorable. Because even if we wanted to stop it, then we'd all have to cooperate and work together in order to stop it, right? Which, in fact, is causing it to happen. So in that way, maybe it is. But then the question is, well, these things aren't themselves bad, right? Specialization and coordination are not themselves bad. We just need to be smart about it. And so here's an example. Um, ethics has gotten a lot more complicated over time, right? So there's, one, there's a difference between being morally de-skilled, which means that people in the past were better at making moral decisions than we are now. There's a difference between that kind of relative uh, situation and a situation where maybe we're the same, but actually the world's gotten morally a lot more complicated. So it, that, in which case it's a relative de-skilling, not an absolute de-skilling. Maybe what we need to do is actually try really hard to get to that higher ethical level, or what we do is we take certain people and we specialize them, right? I'm an ethicist. I work at an ethics center. We can already see in the very fact that I exist in my job that our, our civilization has decided to specialize certain people towards this task. And then the question is, how do we utilize them and how do we get everybody else to work together in order to make a better civilization together? All right. Um, so if we want to think about you know, the metaphorical parent that is technology, uh, we could actually, we can envision good parents, right? There are parents out there who facilitate their children, you know, hopefully most parents, right? Prepare the child to go out into the world and become the best that they can be. So we can learn how to be, you know, grown-ups uh, using our technology responsibly, uh, AR and VR-powered ethics education. So we, had, we just had a person up here, uh, Gemma Busoni, is that her name? Yes, uh, who is sitting right here. And she's you know, doing that, AR and VR powered education. That's something that she's passionate about, and that's awesome. Um, turn that into ethics education, and it could be really interesting, I think. Uh, AI advisors on ethics and human deciders. So you could have a group of people who get together and talk about ethics, and you know, the AI is sitting in the corner or somewhere. I don't know where it's going to be, speaking through the telephone speaker. If it's on the cloud, I don't know, you know where are you going to put it, what kind of interface is it going to have. Um, and it'll say, hey, I think you should do this based on these other types of things. And the people will be like, oh, maybe that's a good idea, maybe it's not a good idea. Um, there are examples, uh, tying this back to healthcare, I had a colleague who just went to the American Society for Bioethics and Humanities, ASBH, and they tried to use AI for calculating who should get organ donations. And they already have a formula for making this happen, for who should get a donated organ. But when you plug it into an AI, it doesn't necessarily give you answers that seem quite right. So even though you're taking the same formula and plugging it into a machine, it still doesn't give things that are necessarily a human would say would be the right answer. Um, I don't want to use up time talking about that right now, but if you want to talk about it, we can talk about it in questions and answers. Now, there's still a problem of speed here, which is that humans, we've gotten used to society going a certain speed, and AI is way faster than we are depending on how much computing power it has, of course. So human civilization is almost already, is already almost the fastest thing on Earth. You've got viral and bacterial evolution are kind of the two things we're competing with right now. Why is that? Well, if you have to get a flu shot every year because the flu virus is mutating, we're basically keeping up with the mutation of viruses. And they have you know, thousands of generations in a year. So we're actually doing a pretty good job keeping pace with even the fastest things on this planet. Um, but we're talking about AI taking that up orders of magnitude further. So it's getting really fast, and humans are basically going to be too slow. One day a signal is going to come in saying, hey, uh, you know, it seems like we're under attack from this AI in some other country, and the AI has to decide how do we retaliate. And it's going to be like a thousandth of a second. 
and it's not going to be able to go call up a human and say, or if it does call up a human, the human's going to be able to respond after it's already over, right? The decision's been made, or the attack has been fulfilled, or the response has already been launched in terms of retaliation. And so we say, is that kind of that the kind of world we want to live in? Um, this is something the partnership on AI, I th think, is going to be th having people think about, right? How, how far is this world going to get out of control? Because if we're already the fastest thing on the planet and we're cranking that up even faster than we can handle in our own heads, then it's going to be a problem. And are good people going to be in charge of this power? Well, we can hope so. All right. So kind of the final momentous slide, I would assert that this is a really big thing. This is one of the biggest things ever. Uh, human intelligence has taken four and a half billion years to show up on this planet, uh, you know, 13 billion years in the universe. And all of a sudden, we're taking that intelligence and we're taking it out of our heads and sticking it in external machines that are going to be specialized towards this kind of stuff. And all of a sudden, things are going to go even faster than they have been before. So it's not just a matter of true news or an internet date. This is kind of a phase change. You can think of it as we once were a solid, now we're turning into a liquid. Or we once were a liquid and we're turning into a gas. There's something very different happening here in terms of the way things relate to each other. Uh, so I'm just going to say it's going to get weird. Uh, that's the only thing I can say about the future. That's my prediction. It's going to be different and strange. All right. And with a reassuring quote from Wendell Berry, the nice thing about this is that the only thing we can do for the future is to do the right thing now. You can't you know, do everything in the future. All you can do is the right thing where you are right now. And based on that, hopefully things will turn out. Thank you. No problem. So John Maynard Keynes, uh, back in 1930, uh, wrote an essay. Um, I think it was something like uh, economic possibilities for grandchildren. He had a very more of a, a positive outlook on what's happening. And um, you know, when it comes to things like technological unemployment, or you know, will we will we lose the skills that we currently have? There are a lot of people that have a point of the view that, but we can go on and do, you know, let the machines do the boring stuff mm -hmm. and we can go and solve bigger problems. So mm -hmm. higher moral problems. Yes. Let, the, let, let AI deal with the basic moral dilemmas and we as humans can do the bigger and greater things. So I'm just curious. I, I, I think that would be great. If that, if that turns out to be the case, then I am all for it. Um, but I also wouldn't want to overlook some of the, the not so great things, right? Um, for example, how do you, you know, take care of family members, raising children, things like that. Turning over, raising your child to a, to a computer screen or something like that, which is something that, you know, kind of happens sometimes. Um, if AI is taking care of all the other things that people don't want to deal with, we need to make sure that we're at least taking care of each other, having interactions with people, taking care of our own children, parents, you know, other people that we love, our friends. Um, so I wouldn't want it to be only just great things. But great things, obviously, are important. There are, there are very huge problems that need to be solved. And AI and uh, humans who can specialize towards solving that is good. So yes, I completely agree with that. Thank you, first of all, for a wonderful presentation. I have one observation and one question. The observation is I've never before seen politics and ethics in the same sentence. <laughs> and the question is, how does one over-specialize ethics? You're talking to a lot of people in the room who specialize in ethics. And I'm sure there's a distinction, and I'm okay. af afraid it was lost on me. OK, so thank you. That's a, that's a good, uh, maybe I didn't describe it adequately. What I mean by over-specializing is that you set some people off to the side and say, these are the ethicists, and now nobody else has to think about ethics. So that would be the over-specialization. So I guess it's actually an under-specialization of everyone else, is that if you can, you, uh, what would you say? You, you, know, you have 100 people in society, and they each have one ethics point, and then 99 of them take their one ethics point and give it to the one person over on the side and say, now you have 100 ethics points, you're our ethicist. Now none of them have any ethics anymore, right? So that might not be the right way to set up a system. Um, and I don't think that's necessarily going to happen, because it's not 
vastly, it's vastly more complicated than that, right? Uh, having ethicists, I think, is really important. Uh, I am one, you know, I better say that, right? <laughs> um, so I'm not trying to put myself out of a job, and I'm not trying to put other ethicists here out of jobs either. Um, what I am saying is that uh, if we want to have kind of a general level of ethics where people can understand ethical decision making and make good ethical decisions, then we need to be emphasizing it perhaps even more than we have. We need to try to get everybody at, uh, at a kind of a, a higher level of ethics so that we can deal with the technologies coming down the, the ro road at us. All right, right there. I was hoping somebody else would ask a question, so this would be a more than half-baked thought, but here, here it goes. Uh, this all sounds very bleak, and, and here's three thoughts of, of why I think that. Um, you said automation and specialization aren't themselves bad, but you also said that de-skilling of various kinds is inevitable with, with specialization and automation. Or we, we necessarily lose skills when we, when we specialize. Um, second thought is, if we look at the anthropological record, the, the, the notions that you seem to be saying about how life used to be, that it was sort of, you know, we're a constant struggle for survival and nasty brutish in short, right? Um, doesn't really seem to be to bear out in the, in the record, that we actually used to live more fulfilled, uh, more uh, lives of more leisure where we spent less time working and more connected in meaningful ways. Uh, and the third point is, it just I'll just put it out there without much evidence. Um, all of the problems that we've tried to solve with specialization and automation are themselves symptoms of previous specialization and automation. Mm -hmm. And if, if that's all true, then what you're saying is bleak because we're headed towards a future that is going to be worse for us as humans, that we're going to be more de-skilled in all sorts of ways that, make, that are fundamental to who we are. And it almost seems that there's no way to fight it. I think there are ways to fight it. Um, I think that you raised a good point, which is that um, the past was not necessarily nasty, British, and short, right? There certainly was a certain... Uh, realm of the population that did have that and still do have it um, in many places of the world. Um, but there's also, you know, a lot more of, of a lot of happiness possible. So there's certainly, um, what's the way to think about it? I think that one of the ways you can think about it is that the world's in constant flux, right? Um, and let's see, I'm reminded of a quote from the end of the movie, The Mission. How many people here have seen the movie, The Mission? It, it's, it's, it's still, I guess, you know, a few people have seen it still. <laughs> but uh, somebody says to somebody else, uh, what can we do? That, thus is the world. And the other person says back to him, no, thus have we made the world. So I think that we're still in charge ultimately, right? We have long-term trends here, but ultimately these are trends that are being borne out by human psychology or by economics or by other things that are actually things that we have control of. Um, now, they might be limited control, or they might be controls that we don't understand fully. So, for example, we might think that the steering wheel is really important, but actually it's the brake pedal. Or maybe it's the, you know, the car's too hot inside. Maybe we should actually be putting the, the air conditioning on. So there might be, uh, you know, come up with whatever metaphor you want to for how you control a system. Um, maybe we haven't discovered that there are buttons that we can push. So I think, and I think that's very likely actually. I think AI is gonna start helping us realize, oh, there are ways that we can push people towards good outcomes that we didn't realize were, th were there. Because of big data analytics, we realize, you know, maybe actually uh, maternal health is a lot more important for stopping criminality later on than, you know, something else. There, we don't know what all the connections are between different things, right? Um, but they might become more apparent. And so it, once we start discovering where the levers and buttons are, maybe we'll have a better opportunity for making that happen. Now, at the same time, um, knowing where the levers and buttons are is only one step, right? Then you have to actually push them and in the, control them in the proper way. So if, for example, if you set up a society which is a totalitarian surveillance state, then that is gonna take all of the moral decision-making power and put it with a certain number of people who are in control of everyone else. 
and everybody else, you know, that's literally the case of it's not everybody voluntarily giving their ethics token over to the one person. It's a case of this group of people taking everybody else's ethical decision-making capacity onto themselves. So I think that they're, um, basically we're just getting in a situation where we're gonna have a lot more choices and a lot more power than we've ever had in the past. So once again, we're just gonna have to decide uh, what are we going to do? We need to figure out how to make these decisions, how to apply ethics in these situations. You, I mean, you raised really hard, uh, good questions. So uh, I hope that uh, you keep thinking about it and that other people do too. Um, Brian? Yes. Uh, just listening to what you just said, though, where is the we? Okay. We are going to have to be doing this and that and the other mm -hmm. thing. Uh, I, I, I try not to subscribe to the idea that there are two kinds of people in the world, people who divide the world into two and the rest. <laughs> but there, there are some people who are more sensitive. They go into ethics. They go into mm. the humanities. They go into whatever. And then there's a group of people who think in engineering terms, who think in scientific terms. Who, and we don't have places where those, I mean, this is a great example, but we don't have a lot of places where that we comes together to make those kinds of decisions. So, yeah, I... I'm, I, I'm, I'm with Mr. Bleak over here. <laughs> I, I'm using we in a very vague fashion, perhaps intentionally. Um, I, I think that um, one, one, in one sense, I'm talking about we, us here in this room, and in another sense, I'm talking about we, the entire planet, all humans, um, and in another sense, probably every scale in between those two, right? Um, I think we don't yet know on what scale all the different control systems are going to operate for us to try to figure out how to get the ship or the airplane going in whatever direction it's supposed to be going in or whatever metaphor you want to use. I think it has to be a multi-layered approach, so we're going to have to go everything from I'm an individual and I need to be good at making moral decisions to I live in an organization or work in an organization and we all need to be able to make good decisions together and I live in a nation and we all need to be able to politically uh, you know, interact with each other in an ethical fashion all the way up to the international level. So I think that there's a multi-scale approach here. It's a very complex problem and if you emphasize only one of those, you're not going to solve it, right? You can have all the... Mm -hmm. So there, there's, there, there are a lot of things to think about, and I, I'm, I'm op I can understand both sides of it, right? I kind of vacillate between being, oh, everything's going to turn out great, we have amazing stuff happening, and oh, uh, we're all going to end up doomed, I better dig my cellar deeper into the ground, right? <laughs> so, but, it, you know, that's not going to save you. <laughs> so the question is, I mean, basically, um, the only option is for us to make it work, right? There's no plan B. Thank you.